Today's cool fact of the day is that when I was 16 years old, I read Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. And I wrote on a notepad and put a piece of paper on my mirror that said, by the time I'm 23, I'm going to make a million dollars. And it didn't work because I made $6 million when I was 26. But what I didn't do is I didn't write down and keep it. <laughs> which is why I lost it when I was 28. Uh, so note to yourself for today's cool fact of the day, be careful what you wish for and wish for it completely. Today's guest is Nora Gedgaudis. Nora is a widely recognized expert on the paleo diet, and she's an author of the international best-selling book, Primal Body, Primal Mind, Beyond the Paleo Diet for Total Health and Longer Life. She's a really experienced nutritional consultant, a speaker, educator, common presenter at AHS or uh, Paleo FX, and really is, is quite an amazing woman. But I wanted to have Nora on the show today to talk about paleo, of course, but also to talk about psychedelics and some of the more mind expanding things, uh, things that I'm certainly into, things that maybe go beyond where you're typically going to go by eating paleo. You'll also find that she's a board certified neurofeedback specialist, which is a little bit of biohacking that I just love. So Nora, thank you for coming on the show. It's really cool to talk about paleo, psychedelics and neurofeedback all in the same interview. I just can't wait. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, actually, these are sort of um, pet passions of mine and it's, it's an interesting combination and I think it combines actually rather surprisingly well when you think about it the right way. You and I would be in 100% agreement there, and there are not a lot of people who've put those things together. Mm. How did you do that? Like, why <laughs> did you get those things, you know, paleo plus neurofeedback? What are you doing here? Well, I think that um, I've had, you know, experiences in life that, that certainly launched me in the direction of an interest in consciousness. I also learned at a relatively early age, uh, you know, somewhere late high school, um, in early college that I could really change the way I felt by changing what I ate and what types of things I supplemented with. And I was also a bit of a, I wouldn't say disciple, but I, I had a, an interest in the work of what I think of as the original biohackers, which were Dirk Pearson, Sandy Shaw back in the late 70s, early 80s. And For people not familiar with Dirk and Sandy, these are some of the founders of the anti-aging movement as we know it today and people who really advocated vitamins and life extension. Right. Yeah, they totally did. And those guys did things to themselves that, you know, that, that were very controversial. They experimented with a lot of things. And then the Morgan Fowler and Dean came out and, you know, and published all their stuff. I had a lot of interest in, in these kinds of things. Um, and, and part of what interested me in all of this was that I suffered from, you know, really clinical depression uh, with varying degrees of severity from the time I was just a very small child from my earliest memories on until, I mean, for over 30 years. Um, and it, it vacillated from chronic dysthymia into really deep, full-blown, you know, suicidal ideation. Uh, and that was how I defined myself, really, through a good part of my life. So uh, anything that had the potential to impact the way I felt and the way I functioned was of intense interest to me. And, of course, this not only sparked an interest in, in the mind, uh, which I've had from uh, early on in psychology and all the things that, that go with that, um, but also, obviously, nutrition uh, became an interest very, very early on and has had its own process of, you know, no pun intended, but its own process of evolution in, in my own sort of sphere of awareness and, um, and study. So uh, all of that. And then also just some... You know, which I'm only some some really deeply personal experiences that I had that involved, um, I guess you might say, uh, other kinds of reality, uh, out of body type stuff, an uh, early uh, um, uh, near death experience and that sort of thing when I was a toddler and and all of that that I think helped also shape my interest in consciousness and trying to understand better what was actually going on and how and uh, and how that tied into 
you know, the greater reality that we call consensual reality and, um, and how it ties in with, I guess, spiritual pursuits. So all of that. And, and there's a whole, whole big chunk of that that is not something I typically talk about, as, as I'm sure you realize. Well, to, to the extent you're willing to talk about it, you're welcome to talk about it on the show today. I, I, I have a similar thing. I, I talk about health and human performance, but if you try and do the human performance thing and you ignore consciousness, <laughs> it's kind of hard to be high performance if you're not aware of the state of your consciousness. I don't know how to do the two separately. So right. um, you, whether you want to try and measure spirituality or not, the, the fact is ask any of the world's top performers <laughs> about their right. spiritual practice or beliefs or whatever. And many, many, in fact, the vast majority of them have something they do there that they think influences them. And we can't prove it does or doesn't. Well, so, we can't even define consciousness. So there you go. <laughs> exactly. Not and, yet uh, anyway. Maybe with right. enough computers we can. <laughs> well, yeah, there, there is, there's some really interesting uh, research going on with respect to uh, what are starting to be thought of. And that's sort of based on Alexander Shulgin's work, you know. And it's, it's, it's interesting, the timing of this show, because... He just passed away about three weeks ago. I didn't hear that. Um, yeah, liver liver cancer, June second. For for people listening who don't know of Alexander Shulkin's work, he's uh, an author of some of the the really most detailed, amazing books on psychedelics and states of consciousness. He was also, I mean, one of the most important psychopharmacologists that ever lived, yeah. and, and influenced a, a lot of people. And and he brought it all within the realm of science. You know, he wasn't well. He may have owned a lava lamp, but. <laughs> But, you know, but it was really interesting because the guy had, he had a license to, uh, to synthesize and possess Schedule 1, you know, materials, uh, Schedule 1 substances of all different kinds. And he had a little laboratory behind his home and where he performed all kinds of experiments and he did all sorts of really interesting things. And it was, you know, once he started publishing uh, for the, I guess, popular consumption, books like Pical and Tikal and, and whatever else, um, you know, the DEA was, was less tolerant of him. <laughs> and and he was one of the ups of Dow Chemical, and I mean, the guy was actually a member of the Bohemian Society, you know, and, uh, you know, just, just an interesting all-around character, but an important one. And, the and, and, he, and, and he, you know, hypothesized the idea that, you know, and, and helped create, I think, a, a massive uh, database of information about various receptors in the brain and how they interact with the various, you know, chemicals we apply to them. And, um, and you know, some are starting to take and, and kind of formulate what could be sort of an apparatus of consciousness, if you will, organs of mind, you know, the way different receptors function together collectively, not with the, the type of topology that we would normally expect to find with other organs like, you know, kidneys and liver, etc., but collections of, of receptors that, that, have, uh, that bind to similar types of chemicals and elicit similar types of effects that seem to form, in a manner of speaking, kind of the architecture apparatus or apparatus of consciousness. And uh, there's really, really interesting uh, research with that. It, I would call his work, some of the preeminent biohacking work as well, on par with what yeah. Dirk and Sandy Pearson did, just because this idea of biohacking where you change the environment around you or the environment inside of you to mm -hmm. get control of your biology. And these books, uh, what PCAL stands for phenylethanolamines yeah. I have known and loved. So basically yeah. synthesized everything you could think of that would cause a hallucinating experience, took it, documented the perception of it, and then documented the neurochemistry of it and tried to map the two, which is really fascinating work. And if you want to tease out what's happening inside your brain, whether it's what happens when you eat grain <laughs> or yeah. what happens when you eat moldy grain, which is LSD, um, right. <laughs> you, right. you know, they do all have a cognitive effect. And it's, it's profoundly interesting that someone, just one man did this. And I regret that I never had a chance to meet him or to have him on the show because, um, you know, he's one of those guys who comes along once in a, once in a generation, if you're lucky and yeah. just has a huge influence. So we'll be using his work, I think, for the next 50 years to understand more about neurotransmitters and how diet and lifestyle and sleep and light exposure affect things that are core to our right. consciousness. But also how some of these, uh, you know, how some of these mental organs may have influenced our own emergence as, as human beings and, and what distinguishes us 
uh, I think, from other animals. I mean, I think once upon a time, you know, everything that lived on on this planet was, you know, it, it just pretty much everything in the wild, it was largely preoccupied with with basic survival, with with yeah. procuring food, with reproducing, with um, you know, outrunning uh, you know dangers in the environment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it's sort of like about a hundred thousand years ago. The, there was sort of a, a shift, at least in the archaeological uh, record, where they started to find uh, things that represented uh, an appreciation appreciation of the symbolic, right? You know, small little bits, of, small little beads with tiny drilled holes that you know were obviously things that we adorn ourselves in a symbolic sort of a way, and um, and uh, different types of you know, rock art that began emerging, you know, 77,000 years ago or what have you. And, th and then all of a sudden, it's like 40,000 years ago, this, this switch flips on all over the world. And now uh, cave art is starting to emerge that clearly depicts a preoccupation with what we might term the spirit world and uh, other types of a sort of non-ordinary reality, if you will. And... Uh, of course, there there are. Um, I'm trying to remember the guy's name now. I think it's a David Lewis Williams. You know, hypothesized the idea that that these earliest artists were actually shamans. You know, and that were by definition act intentionally accessing non ordinary reality as a way of. Um, you know, who knows? I mean, today shamans intentionally use techniques to access non ordinary reality as a way of either. Um, uh, finding a, a means of healing or and finding answers to questions or some form of divination uh, but shamanism is primarily oriented toward toward healing practices but th to me this is there's something that is profoundly uh, it's sort of like the point at which we as a species found meaning in our own existence and you know in theogens uh, are a likely source of this for us. It certainly makes sense that, and especially if you look at uh, the work of, um, um, oh God, what was his name? Benny Shannon from uh, the Hebrew University, uh, who did work uh, researching the experiences of people all over the world who had taken these different entheogens, who didn't know each other, who weren't sharing right, information. Right and found commonality of experience, commonality of certain types of entities that would show up or certain sorts of visual patterns that would emerge. And if these things are just simply generated by our individual brains, why is there so much similarity uh, be between these experiences and, and yeah, differences certainly in the different types of entheogens in the way they manifest um, uh, these, these unique qualities. So. Uh, it, it, it's all very, very uh, interesting stuff. It also reminds me of the work of Stan Groff, who treated yeah. 10,000 people with LSD as a licensed therapist in right. Czechoslovakia. I've, right. I've actually done holotropic breathing with Stan Groff twice in person. Yeah. And he, he's uh, no longer using LSD because it became a Schedule One substance. He uses a yogic breathing technique that causes uh, right. similar hallucinations. And deprivation in the brain. I'm not yeah. a huge fan mm -hmm. of holotropic breath work just simply by virtue of the fact that I think it's actually damaging to the brain. To do it regularly is not a great idea. I also do hyperbaric mm -hmm. and some other ozone things yeah, yeah, <laughs> because it's compensatory. Although, you know, I don't know how you can comp compensate for a destroyed neuron, but. Uh, well, there's, uh, if you're taking paracetam, which is one yeah. of the smart drugs I recommend, it's protective in a low oxygen environment. So I figure if you're on racetams and you're doing holotropic breathing, you know, I've had great personal progress from sure. that sort of thing, but I've also done ayahuasca in South America with shamans. It's one of those things, like you're saying, where, where something happens to the con our consciousness as we evolved. And when I look at something we hear at, you know, the Ancestral Health uh, Symposium, talking about the evolution of nutrition, my experience of the world is that my consciousness is directly influenced by what I eat and that there are nuances in what I eat. Like, you know, coffee isn't just coffee. There's, you know, different qualities and types. And if you're smoking pot, <laughs> which species of pot are you smoking? Did you get a different buzz from it? And right. people who know that, if was it a grass-fed steak or was it, you know, a commodity steak from, you know, the, the local grocer thing? 
you feel different when you eat them if you're paying attention to how you feel. Right. Um, and I'm excited to find that there are a few experts who are looking at the cognitive aspects, things like grain brain. We're looking yeah. at what's happening up here from what you put into the body versus did I get ripped abs? You know, it, it's a different mindset. Um, what's, what's your take on it? I mean, how important is food quality for consciousness? It's everything, you know, and, and really the food supply we have today, the one that is, you know, sort of, you know, mainstream available you know, in regular grocery stores or whatever, I mean, it's a good recipe for dumbing down. You know? um, and, you know, we, we live, I think, in a much more, in many respects, a much more hostile environment than our, you know, primate or, or our uh, hominid antecedents did. Uh, it's sort of deceptively uh, uh, safe and friendly, but uh, really, you know, we're sitting in our climate-controlled, you know, environments, watching celebrity bloopers and eating, you know, nutrient-devoid garbage as a means of entertainment, not giving any thought at all to the fact that these are the things that form the very compounds that run our biochemistry and our neurochemistry. Our brains, basically, the health or lack of thereof of our brains, you know, define how it is that we experience the world, you know, whether or not uh, we have any, uh, whatever meaning we have in our life is, is going to be directly um, mitigated by the health and, and functioning of our brains and biochemistry. And if we're in a state of chronic neuroinflammation, uh, which a great many people are, and blood-brain barrier compromise and all that good stuff that comes with it, uh, it's it, it doesn't speak very brightly for um, for the consciousness of our culture, which you know, surprise, um, um, or the future of our culture. And we really do, to kind of paraphrase uh, uh, Albert Einstein, you know, we do really do require a very different way of thinking in the future if we're going to survive the time period we're in. Would you talk for a minute or two about the causes of neuroinflammation and this blood-brain barrier breakdown? I, I know I had both of those problems in my mid-20s, and I don't sure. believe I have them anymore. Uh, so just help people understand the process. Right. So, um, so neuroinflammation, which of course is brain inflammation, can be induced um, through exposure to uh, well, antigenic substances, whether these be dietary antigens or environmental uh, compounds of different types, uh, haptins, which are environmental uh, chemi you know, chemicals sort of introduced into the environment, heavy metals, uh, things of that nature. What, what uh, about um, mold toxins? I mean, this is an area where I've spent a lot of time as antigens. Do you have any experience with those, um, it, whether with inhaled? Toxins? mold or mycotoxins, whether inhaled well, or eaten? Mycotoxins would be in that category, okay. certainly. And there are some people that are highly sensitive okay. to them. Whether or not, see, none of these compounds or substances that we talk about that are in, in environmental haptins that, you know, are substances that can elicit an immune response in us, mm -hmm. they're, they're not really good for anybody. Under any <laughs> exactly. Circumstances, right? <laughs> Just they're not, they're, not, uh, they're not good for anyone. Whether or not they're likely to devastate your health, however, depends on whether or not you happen to have an immunologic reactivity to those substances. So, right. um, and so we're all exposed to mycotoxins every day. We're all exposed to phthalates and BPA, and Correct. we're all exposed to, you know, dioxin and all kinds of things. Heavy metals, for instance. I mean, yep. everybody's got heavy metals. I'm sorry, you know. I mean, you can do <coughs> hair analyses. You know, I, I don't mean mm -hmm. to diminish some uh, good work that may be done with that, but I think it's over overemphasized that a person has heavy metals. Again, the question needs to be, are you experiencing an immunologic reactivity to those? And you find that out yeah. through accurate testing. Cyrex is the only lab doing that accurate testing. You, you figure that out and then, you know, you go from there to address the, the impact that those things are having and eliminating those particular substances from your life. It, it's interesting. Uh, my wife, uh, Lana, and I used to run a medical lab testing company where we were using radioactive cell counting techniques to measure white blood cell proliferation in response to heavy metals or a bunch of other things. And we found there's a non-antibody mediated uh, inflammation that happens in some people in response to titanium or gold or nickel or any of the other metals, cadmium, mercury, methylmercury, et cetera. Right. 
And, and so it, it's, it's really interesting that the control switch for that may be actually the amount of chronic stress you're under. So if right. you're exposed to an antigen when you're highly stressed, there can be one immunological response. And if you're not stressed and you're exposed to the same thing, your body's like, ah, oh, whatever, water under the bridge. Well, when it comes to neuroinflammation, which was sort of, sort of more to the point, um, you know, a lot depends too uh, what the integrity is of your blood-brain barrier. Yeah. And, um, you know, the same things that mitigate blood-brain barrier integrity are what mitigate, you know, gut barrier integrity. And so uh, the exposure to things like uh, gluten, whether or not you have an immunologic reactivity to gluten <laughs> yeah, or not, yeah. okay, <laughs> is going to stimulate the production of zonulin, which controls intestinal and also blood-brain barrier permeability. So at, in an acute sort of sense, with the consumption of these things, you are going to create compromise that lasts for a few hours following that. And whatever's in that superhighway called your bloodstream during that time is what every tissue and organ is going to be exposed to, including, you know, your brain. Um, but there's also, of course, things like lipopolysaccharides that are the byproduct of sort of these endotoxins produced by bacteria mm -hmm. uh, as a product of dysbiosis or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And those also will mitigate uh, blood-brain barrier and uh, gut permeability. So, um, you know, there are tests that can help us determine whether or not uh, we have that type of compromise and what the nature of that compromise is. And again, that's Cyrex. I don't have any financial ties to Cyrex. I just, I'm just very uh, impressed with with the accuracy and and the. Um, you know, sort of the comprehensiveness of the testing that they offer. Um, fact, because nobody else really doing anything like them. Uh, Tom O'Brien from the Gluten Free Summit was on the show yeah. earlier. He's a, a good friend. Uh, and He's a he, good friend of mine too. Oh, is yeah. he? Okay. Mm -hmm. He was mentioning the same thing. I, I'm a big fan of the Cyrix panels as well. Yeah. And it's it's interesting to find that, you know, you, you get this food and it may cross-react with the lining of your nerves. And if you're yeah. listening to this, you know, the lining of your nerves is kind of important because when it goes away, you have neurodegenerative disease. You can be in a wheelchair yeah. or in a mental hospital from this. And right. if the foods you're eating are making your immune system do this to you, you owe it to yourself to know what foods do that and to not put them in your body until they right. are non-reactive. And some of the, the bulletproof Something diet... Something will never be non-reactive. That's true, like gluten. I just don't gluten, believe dairy, gluten. Yeah. I do not allow my kids to ever eat gluten. It's not a special treat. No more than right. heroin is a special treat. You just don't exactly. eat that crap, right? Right. I totally agree with you. I'm also a really good friends uh, um, with um, <laughs> Rodney Ford in New Zealand, uh, uh, Dr. Rodney Ford, who's for like 40 years now been crusading as a medical doctor for a zero gluten world. Does he still have his medical license? Yes, he does. That's yeah. because he's in New Zealand. Uh, a lot of the, <laughs> the cutting yeah, edge guys I work with um, have had their licenses uh, removed or they've had to move to another state because they're right. persecuted for these new ideas that you know, right. I'm absolutely convinced. You know, There are guys today who are discovering the next asbestos and they talk about it and right. everyone yells at them and says, it has no effect, but it does. And there's thousands right. of studies, but people haven't linked the pieces. And well, yeah, what, what I love about what Rodney's doing in New Zealand is that, you know, he's really made the case for gluten being a, a, a profound problem in and of itself. And yeah. there's, you know, people like, and, and, you know, doing God's work, as they say, Jeffrey Smith, who, you know, is, oh, yeah. you know, is, is awesome. But, you know, if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And in his Correct. mind, it's all about GMOs. And that's what's creating the problem. It's not gluten so much. It's GMOs or it's glyphosate or, you know, Stephanie Seneff has a great paper out mm -hmm. on glyphosate. That's an adjuvant, right? Yes. I mean, it's going to augment the impact of these substances and their impact on, on our immunologic system, et cetera. But there's still the foundational issue of these very substances. New Zealand doesn't have GMOs right now. I mean, give it time. But, you know, they're, they're not, um, they don't have the complication of those particular substances, and, and that's not complicating Rodney's work. So, um, uh, you know, clearly gluten is an issue. And I know there's been a rash of articles saying, oh, gluten, that's, that's just the big, it's, it's, it's a myth. It's, you know, scientifically disproven now. You know? <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I almost can't even dignify that with, you know, uh, you know, with an incensed remark because it's, it's yeah. ridiculous. And also scientifically disproving something. How do yeah. we do that again? Given right. our so, proving the lack of existence. We can say there's some evidence this way, some evidence this way. And 
our evidence is always a, a constantly sliding thing right. to understand we're more and more certain or less and less certain. But, yeah. you know, disproving that gluten is, is unhealthy for most humans would be very hard to do, given the science that I'm familiar with. Right. And, you know, where would, what would the financial gain be for that? <laughs> oh, I don't know. Just I can't imagine any, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, barely any at all. Barely any at all. Well, what about, what about sugar versus gluten? So if, if we both agree and assume people who've heard the show a few times are aware that gluten really isn't a fuel for high performance humans, uh, that right. there are better foods for you no matter what, even if you like the taste of gluten, whatever. So what about sugar? What's your take on sugar? <laughs> You don't know me too well, do you? I do, but I want people to hear. <laughs> yeah, so basically, you know, the take is that, and you know, you were mentioning, you know, what are the, some of the sources of neuroinflammation? Well, clearly, you know, blood sugar surges are among uh, those things that are a major source of neuroinflammatory um, uh, problems and also, you know, potentially also uh, immune dysregulatory uh, problems. And it's sugar, and it's also the insulin that sugar provokes, and... Uh, it's the glycation and the free radical damage that glycation provokes and, um, and all of that, that there's no question that sugar is, is enormously destabilizing to us uh, cognitively, I mean, uh, neurologically. Um, and it is, you know, the idea that we need glucose in order, as a primary source of fuel in order to function is, it, it's a myth. And it's, it's a kind of a conditionally, it's, it's only conditionally true. It's only true if we have cultivated a rather unnatural dependence on glucose as our primary source of fuel. Uh, we're actually born in a state of ketosis. Yes. Okay. Well, that's, that's the way we come into the world. And we don't start utilizing glucose as a brain fuel until carbohydrates, uh, or as a primary brain fuel, until carbohydrates are actually introduced. And if you look at, you know, the... I, I can think of, if you don't mind my going conspiracy theorist on you for at least a second, <laughs> you know, the Alex Jones side of Norwich coming through here, that, you know, I can hardly think of a single multinational corporation that wouldn't be heavily invested in every man, woman, and child on the planet being dependent on carbohydrates as a primary source of fuel. Um, it's extremely cheap to produce. It's highly profitable. You know, you'll never pr generate a 5,000% profit on a steak like you can a box of cereal. And furthermore, it keeps people constantly hungry. And, uh, you know, <laughs> yes. if you're eating carbs, you're basically living on the, the equivalent of what I refer to as metabolic kindling. You know, I use this sort of wood stove analogy, which I'm sure you've probably heard, you know, where, you know, if, if you had just a wood stove to heat your home with, uh, you know, you try to think, well, what would the most efficient type of fuel be? Well, I look at carbohydrates as largely being the equivalent of metabolic kindling. So your brown rice, your beans, your sweet potatoes, your, you know, things of that nature, um, you're basically looking at what would be the equivalent of twigs on that metabolic fire. Your white rice, your white potatoes, so-called safe starches, don't get me started. Um, your, um, you know, bread, pasta, things of that nature are a little bit more akin to crumpling up and throwing paper on that metabolic fire. You know, alcohol and sweetened beverages, that's like lighter fluid or gasoline on that metabolic fire. And if all you had was kindling piled up to heat your home with, you could certainly do it. But what would your life look like? You'd be parked in front of that wood stove, you'd be spending all day long grabbing handfuls of kindling to throw in to keep that fire going, and you'd have a fairly constant preoccupation with that. And if you took your attention off of that even for a moment or two, uh, well, or, or for an hour or two, say, um, you might suddenly find, gee, the house is getting cold. Or say you wake up at 3 yeah. o'clock in the morning, and yes, there is there's an analogy there. Um, and suddenly you look in the, in the wood stove and the fire's going out, and holy crap, now I've got to cram it full of paper and twigs and lighter fluid, whatever, to get it going again. And th that's, to me, it's a bit of an, a form of enslavement to have that constant preoccupation, whether you're aware of that preoccupation or not. Well, when but you, the alternative, of course, is taking a nice big fat log and putting that <laughs> on the fire and burning that in lieu of glucose, and suddenly now you are free. You throw that log on the fire and you can walk off and live your life and you know without having to really think about it much. And you look in the wood stove and the fire's burning down, it's like, oh, fire's burning down, I'll throw another log on there. Nothing more liberating, nothing more stabilizing to the brain and nervous system. Um, if I 
eat something that is, uh, you, you know, like a, I don't know, a, you know, a little piece of a little tiny two ounce sausage patty, you know, and duck fat or something at seven o'clock in the morning. And by two in the afternoon, if I haven't eaten something, I might, I might be hungry, but I'm not suffering energy issues with that. Yeah, I'm not, you're not desperate. Yeah, I'm not, I don't have brain fog. I, my mood isn't something that rhymes with itchy. You know, I'm not uh, <laughs> cantankerous or jittery. I'm just hungry, which is how it's supposed to be. And when I eat, again, I, I'm basically not hungry anymore. And, you, and, it, and it's a basically an even burning thing. You use words like freedom and liberation, and, and those are, are words I, I could not agree with more. Having been a 300 pound guy, eating like that. I'm sorry, I'm ending the meeting because if I don't eat, I'm going to have to kill one of you right now and eat you. Exactly. So like, I'm done. So yeah. fully on board with that. And, and you said something though about safe starches. I want to relate an experience that I had yeah. and ask for your explanation of it, given your understanding. Sure. All right. So I decided I was going to try and replicate almost like an Eskimo level of diet. So I, I cranked my, my fat up you know, around 70%. And I ate about a serving of vegetables a day. And I did this for three months. And what I experienced was extreme dry eyes, dry sinuses. Um, I woke up nine times per night, according to my sleep monitoring systems. And I didn't know I was waking up nine times a night. I felt like a zombie when I woke up. I got headaches. I got histamine problems. Yeah. But when once or twice a week, I have a little bit of kindling, i.e. sweet potatoes, white rice kind of stuff for dinner, the symptoms all went away. What happened to my metabolism there? Well, it wasn't a glucose deficiency, okay? Now, glucose may have ameliorated the symptom the way aspirin can ameliorate the symptom of a headache, but it doesn't mean that we should all be taking aspirin every day. Um, you now, there are other things that are potentially involved in mucus production, too, like certain amino acids that are critical and, you know, glycine, choline, whatever, that are really rich in things like gelatin and, and whatever have you that you know, we, you know, we're supposed to be eating nose to tail. We're not just supposed to yeah. be eating steaks, right? I, I do eat gelatin, uh, right? Right, awful, and, and uh, you know, the connective tissue and things like that. But assuming everything is working right in our system, we should be able to produce sufficient glucose to meet whatever the requirements are in those situations. If you're not, you need to dig deeper. You need to figure out what is going on. Now, I have a book coming out on, uh, on uh, that basically is going to bring the whole subject of what people think of as adrenal fatigue into the 21st century and demythologize that a bit. Good. But one of the aspects of that has to do with the fact that, that for instance, certain cytokines uh, will have a profoundly dampening uh, effect on hypothalamic output on the PBN cells of the hypothalamus, which are responsible for mitigating the amount of cortisol that we are producing at any given time. And cortisol, of course, is truly a blood sugar hormone. Insulin isn't, but, blood, uh, but cortisol is. And, you know, we need a, a certain amount of substances like cortisol and, and uh, growth hormone and, and, and things of that nature, uh, you know, uh, uh, norepinephrine, epinephrine, adrenaline, etc., you know, do have uh, blood sugar effects. But if for some reason we're unable to produce sufficient cortisol, then we might experience uh, the effects of low blood sugar uh, because we're, for some reason, we're not able to naturally sort of mitigate our own glucose levels relative to need as easily. And you see sometimes, you know, ASIs of people with these issues where the cortisol is sort of flatlined on them and they're just not able. And this is not adrenal exhaustion. It, it, it's pituitary uh, dysfunction, right? Not necessarily. No, okay. No, it, it could be. That's one aspect of it. It could also be, uh, for instance, uh, chronic infections and things like that can have yeah. a profoundly dampening effect on hypothalamic output, which in, in not just in addition, not just neurotransmitter output, but also the production of adequate levels of cortisol. You could also be having, uh, you know, adrenal antibody production that you're not aware yeah. of. And adrenal autoimmunity is not at all uncommon. Um, it's just that what we call Addison's disease is very rarely diagnosed because you, you have to be at a place of near total tissue destruction, literally 90% tissue destruction. That is the medical standard of diagnosis. Which is ridiculous. That, that diagnosis, yeah. Well, yeah. In, in the, the diagnosis of autoimmune disease in general is ridiculous, yeah. you know, the, the way that's defined. So if you're only at half that level of you know, adrenal uh, destruction. I promise you'll notice every, you know, this in every <laughs> yeah. part of the you feel in function, but you're not going to have any answers. And you're also probably going to experience 
you know, chronic uh, feelings of, um, but it wouldn't have to be just that. It could be any form of autoimmunity that can lead to blood glucose dysregulation. Certainly Hashimoto's yeah. is also characteristically, uh, people tend to have, um, you know, blood sugar dysregulation. I mean, I've never met a Hashimoto's person that didn't have, that didn't have blood sugar issues. I, I used don't. to have Hashimoto's. I had the antibodies and the symptoms, and I got rid of it. I have no antibodies and no symptoms of it. Well, you, what you are what you are is in a state of remission. I mean, there's yeah. no such thing as cure, you know. But but you're managing it well, and that's great. Yeah, you know? it's uh, it, it's interesting, you know, that if there aren't any antibodies and it's not happening, you know, remission versus cure is, is largely semantic at that point, right? It may come back, yes. it may not. But, you know, once these genes switch on, they don't tend to switch off again. Uh, at least that's the, the general consensus in the field of immunology, that there really yeah. is no such thing as a reversal of these disease processes or an elimination of them. You've quieted it down, and that's the best thing we can hope for is the right. healthy mitigation. I mean, you figured out your probably biggest trigger, which was mycotoxins for yep. you. For somebody else, it might have been mercury exposure. You know, I had some of that too. I, I probably like got the triple crown of exposures um, younger in li earlier in life. Um, but the, this cross reactivity stuff, going back to Cyrex Labs, right? You know, right. these things commonly cross react. So you know, mold toxins cross react with casein and gluten, and they cross react with mycotoxins. And so it, it's it's kind of a big happy, bowl. Happy. Yeah, it's like it's like there's a whole set of things that never benefit human performance and could completely decimate yours. So the general best practice is don't spend a lot of time around those things and you're likely to perform much better for longer periods of time right. and age less and feel better and be less of a jerk, you know? <laughs> right, right, yeah. well, yeah, okay. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, I also have to wonder about some of the dry eye stuff and whatever else because, you know, Sjogren's syndrome is not entirely uncommon either. It's not that commonly diagnosed, but producing the kinds of antibodies that might give rise to that may not be entirely uncommon either. So some of what I hear is reports of, I mean, you know, I eat what amounts to pretty much an Eskimo diet. I don't have any issues with lack of mucus or dry eye or any of that yeah. stuff. Um, yeah. So those symptoms just aren't really an issue for me. But uh, my mother had Hashimoto's and also had Sjogren, or she still does, actually has Sjogren's and, and uh, a plethora of other issues. Uh, usually 80% of the time with Hashimoto's, there are other antibodies involved. I, I certainly had issues with mucus because I could tell yeah. from the dry sinuses. And sadly, I actually developed several new food allergies as a result of this because I didn't have mucus in the lining of my stomach, so I got gut uh -huh. permeability. Which I mean, eggs are one of the most amazing foods on, on earth, unless you. Not for me either. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I'm I'm bummed because you know they, they were a primary part of of my recovery, and now I have an immune reaction to them because I didn't have enough mucus in the lining of my gut, and maybe I have a problem with generating enough polysaccharides from protein, but you know who knows? So I I tend to think being in ketosis dipping out, dipping, dipping back in. In other words, if you have a big fire, if every now and then you throw a few pieces of kindling on there, you keep the fire going. And I don't think it's particularly harmful. And maybe for the average non-perfect dieting person, that might be an easier path to compliance than, you know, never, never touch a carb again kind of thing. Well, I find that it's easier to, uh, to stick to things if you you know, if those things aren't really on your radar screen, right? Yeah. I mean, I just, I just don't really even think about that stuff. Now, mind you, I might get, a, I mean, like this time of year, there are a lot of berries, right, yeah. that are coming out. And I'm living in like the berry capital of the world here in Oregon. So I enjoy those things. I actually think there is some, uh, you know, phytonutrient, uh, you know, polyphenol antioxidant, yeah. you know, value to these things. And so a handful or two here and there, you know that's that's sort of my my carb fix for the you know for the year is <laughs> sort of like the berry thing. I I don't ever eat gluten ever, and I don't ever yeah. eat refined starches, and I don't ever eat white potatoes, white rice, anything like that. I just consider those things so non-essential uh, to us. There there is you can have you know to quote uh, uh, Bernstein, you know you can have. Uh, an amino acid deficiency, you can have an essential fatty acid deficiency, but there is no such thing in any medical textbook on earth as a carbohydrate deficiency. It just, there is no such thing as a glucose deficiency per se. Um, you can have uh, issues with being able to generate enough because there are other things going on, at which point 
that's not a glucose deficiency. That is a deeper problem that needs to be ferreted out, in my view. So I, I don't know uh, how far most people are going to go down ferreting out those deeper issues. I mean, I, I've spent $300,000 ferreting out issues and hacking myself over the past 15 right. years. And there's still some stuff I don't know. I would right. love to be able to say that on a, you know, a high fat, super high quality protein diet without any carbs forever that I perform well. But I find that that I don't and and I've had enough coaching clients you know, where their sleep quality goes away. If there isn't a little bit of carb every three days, especially in women, fertility problems. You don't see this with people? Uh-huh. No. Interesting. Not really, no. I mean, and I certainly don't experience those things. Um, now, I've, I've seen some of the reports that you've talked about online, but again, it's not a carb deficiency. And that's the thing. And uh, there's just too much, I think, uh, you know, credence that's being given to the whole safe starch idea that, and which I don't necessarily consider safe at all. Certainly, the you know, nightshades are not necessarily what I think of as safe. Agreed. And I don't do nightshades. Even white rice can be cross-reactive with wheat. So, uh, for a lot of people, so, and these are anything but paleo foods. You know, these are very, very new new foods to us. So again, you know, I have I um, I get you know, clients that are, have been lifelong migraine sufferers. And, you know, for them, you know, they find, well, yes, yeah, certain medications, you know, work for them. And, you know, yeah, did they have that, did they have that, um, you know, an aspirin deficiency or whatever else, you know, benefited their migraine? Uh, you know, is it enough to say, well, that works for me and therefore I'm not going to dig any deeper? I guess it depends on where your on what you and what you value foundationally and where your priorities are. I'm I'm always wanting to dig deeper. I'm very foundational and very functional in my thinking. And if it doesn't make logical sense to me, then I you know, based on what I know about about physiology and our evolutionary history, then to me it's 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 a sign that I need to dig deeper to figure out what is the foundational problem. And it could be different things for different people. What about resistant starch? I asked Mark Sisson this on the show, and oh. I've had Richard Nikolai on, and you know, I, I've experimented a lot with it. I've had more gas and more allergies <laughs> lately as a result of it. But also, you know, there are some benefits that some people seem to get. So, what's your take on it? I don't think any of the benefits you get from so-called resistant starch are not things that can't be gotten from eating fibrous vegetables or whatever else. And if you happen to be somebody with small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, I promise you it will make things worse for you. Oh, it, it will for sure. You know, the resistant starch isn't even food. It's, it's not even starch. It's, it, it's food for the bacteria that have sort of hacked your system. And in, right. in, my, in the Bulletproof Diet book that comes out, by the way, bulletproofdietbook.com, if you haven't already signed up so I can email you, please right. do. Um, that has uh, the research for that book, fermenting collagen in the gut can make as much butyrate as fermenting resistant starch. So I, I'm actually open to the idea of resistant starch for some types of people, um, carefully timed, and yeah. it has to do with, with some of the ratios of things in the gut. But for the most part, I'm like, I, I will use resistant starch in the evening sometimes with probiotics, and it seems to have benefit. But if I do it during the day and I do it all the time, I tend to gain weight and I get um, environmental allergies that I don't normally have. Yeah, you know, it, again, it's not even really food for us. So to me, it's kind of a silly thing. Um, I just don't really see the point. I mean, it, it, you know, if you have 80, 85 percent healthy gut bacteria, then you might actually be feeding them. But it's not like you can't get that, that fiber to feed the bacteria eating other things, you know, that are actually food for us. <laughs> Uh, in some way, shape, or form. So, uh, you know, I don't actually, I don't really have the time for, you know, dealing with the whole safe or the, the whole resistant starch uh, debate. To me, it, I've got better things to spend my time on because it doesn't okay. really represent something that, that is really food in any way. And you know, if people benefit from it, fine. You know, I'm, it sounds okay. delicious, but. I, I don't actually think corn resistant corn starch is very delicious. It tastes no. like chalk. It's the only one that worked for me. You know, raw potatoes and you know, have at it if you want. But you know, <laughs> I, I'd rather eat real food myself. I, I've been a, an early supporter of Ubiome, one of the two big things, along with American Gut Project, that's sequencing mm -hmm. the human gut. And yeah, one of the reasons that Bulletproof Coffee does what it does is mm -hmm. because it has a specific modulatory effect on gut bacteria, mm -hmm. which is interesting that polyphenols are the other probiotic 
that isn't resistant starch. And polyphenols, right. of course, are high in coffee and brightly colored vegetables and things like that. So it's, it, it's, there's a lot we don't know about the gut biome. And I'm fascinated to, you know, honestly, if I could get a toilet that measured my gut biome every time I went, I would totally buy that toilet and I would get Invent like a mortgage. Invent it, dude. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> so it, put, it, put it on your, you know, on your page right next to the squatty potties. And yeah, yeah. It, I, I've, I've reserved a slot in the Bulletproof Diet that says, look, some people really do benefit, but you're probably going to not like the effect of learning to eat resistant starch because... Um, one of my uh, employees, um, uh, a middle-aged woman, I, I sent her a sample of, of a resistant starch and said, well, I don't know, I, I'm writing about this uh, a little bit in the Bulletproof Diet book, and certainly I've talked about it on the blog. Uh, try it. And she wrote back, and it was one sentence, I hate resistant starch. Like, I, <laughs> I feel like I'm pregnant, you know, and, and the resistant starch crowd would say, well, that's because she doesn't have the right bacteria in her gut. And I'm like, well, I, I mean, I've been taking bags of probiotics for more than a decade, like like the very expensive, highest end ones, and I know what the different species do, and I can tolerate some, but if I take glucoman, man, it, it's over. So I'm right. I'm interested yeah. to hear you. Like it's not worth the time, and I'm almost there. But for some people, it <laughs> is transformative, and I want to include those people. So all right. Yeah. Well. Okay. Cool. Well, we're we're running low on time, and we didn't even get much of a chance to talk oh. about neurofeedback in oh, one yeah. in one minute or less. What are the foods that make people perform better in neurofeedback, if you've ever noticed a difference? Well, yeah, because I, I do work with that. Anything yeah. that's going to enhance the functioning of the brain. So in other words, there's nothing more nourishing to the brain than dietary fat you know, and ketone production, <laughs> right, baby? Ketones. Um, and there's nothing more uh, destabilizing to the brain and nervous system than sugar and starch. And, and so, you know, and also dietary antigens you are actually experiencing an immune reactivity to or the kinds of things that are just simply going to have a neuroinflammatory effect. So uh, depending on what, where people are at when they come in, we may or may not start out addressing those things, but I definitely see an enormous uh, synergy between uh, nutritional approaches to, to the brain and something like neurofeedback. It's a great combination. It's almost, I consider it almost foolproof combination actually. I've found that when I bring clients through the 40 years of Zen program, which is a seven day like residential brain training thing, that if they're taking the brain octane oil, which uh, converts to ketones very, very quickly, uh, mm -hmm. that they can go twice as long before they just they, they run out of energy to do more neurofeedback. So just the, the duration of the sessions is like, wow, that's awesome. And when I do it, of course, I have the same thing. I, I wouldn't dream of going in there without a lot of ketones in my body because my brain wants that to really do those Your things. Your brain has to have some raw materials to work with in order yeah. to function, right? You know? It does. And, and you know, if I'm dealing with somebody who's a chronic you know, hypoglycemic or whatever else, and they come in and, they, and all they've had to eat all day is a cup of coffee and a croissant at you know, 3 o'clock <laughs> in the afternoon, and I know people like that, um, the brain is going to have like nothing to work with. Yeah. It's, what is the point of even being here? You know, it's just you're just basically you know torturing raw nerves. You know, you, you've got to <laughs> you've got to put yourself in a position of giving your brain something it, it, that it can actually do something with. Yeah. So uh, you know, the more I can convince people to cultivate a a more predominantly ketogenic metabolism, far and away the better off they are, and the, the better they function, um, and the more the more the more quickly they respond and the more sustained and more optimized their response to brain training becomes over time. Um, and uh, yeah, neurofeedback is, is profoundly uh, powerful stuff. But again, I can be doing the best brain training protocol in the world and it will never put a nutrient there that's not there. It's not going to yeah. take away some some interfering substance that doesn't belong. So and, you, you know, do the do the hardware first and then reprogram the software. But if you try and do software with, with flaky hardware that has a bad power supply, you're just not going to get what you want. And yeah, good luck with that. Yeah, that's the hacker in me speaking right there. Yeah, me too. <laughs> so we're down to our final question. This is one that every guest except that one time when I forgot, probably because I didn't have enough ketones, uh, to ask this one question. Oh, shoot. Yeah. Okay. Ready? It, uh, well, I'll try. Yeah. It's... Given all the things you've learned, both you know, in your research and just in your life, the three most important pieces of advice that you would share with people who want to perform better. So if you want to kick more ass, do these three things. I'd say that we all need to, to uh, 
rather than relying on those that, that are either self-proclaimed or so-called recognized experts on, on your body and mind, you know, become, take an interest in your own, the machine in which you inhabit, yeah. right? Um, and because no one will ever care more about your health or well-being than you. And, and understanding something, you don't have to understand it at a PhD level, but understanding enough about how your brain and, and body function um, to, to be able to, I mean, you know, you occupy this thing, so you may as well understand something about it. And the more you understand, the better you're likely to function and the better you're likely to feel in life and the better your quality of life is likely to be. So taking uh, and, and really prioritizing the things in life that you do have control over in the face of all the things that we don't. I sometimes, I cut, sort of coined the phrase, become a primal ninja warrior, right? Um, <laughs> it, it's, it's that whole idea of, you know, we're faced with all of these things that, um, that we seemingly have no control over in our environment, all of the, the pollutants, all of the compromise to our food supply, air and water, etc., all the things we're being exposed to that we can't even see, that aren't even tangible to us that are clearly influencing our health, everything from EMFs to radiation to, you know, who knows what. We, it's incumbent upon us in the face of all of this to really take control of the things that we can and make those things a priority. What we choose to put in our mouths is definitely one of those things. Um, and, uh, um, and really, you know, making, making that a very... Uh, Develop, developing that firsthand knowing of where your food comes from, uh, being a very important part of that, and understanding the difference between, uh, you know, the the uh, the more naturally produced versions of those foods right. that would have been a lot more like what our developmental or or our sort of uh, hominid antecedents would have had available to them, as opposed to the stuff that has been grown in depleted soils and dumped. You know, loaded with pesticides or, or fed and tortured in feedlots. You know, that stuff isn't food, right? And if it wouldn't look like food to somebody wandering around 40 or 50,000 years ago with a loincloth and a spear or a pair of mucklucks, as it were, it's probably not food for us now either. So, Pretty, uh, pretty amazing advice. Uh, I, I, I'm reminded of a story a friend of mine relayed when her grandfather came over and, and from somewhere in Eastern Europe where he had his own chickens and really never ate anyone else's eggs. And, and he got a dozen of these omega-3 industrial egg things and he cracked one open and he looked at it and he said, was the chicken sick? Yeah. <laughs> so, that's, oh, the yeah. that's the response from, you know, people 500 or whatever, 5,000 years ago, like this is meat, like bleh, not food. So. Yeah. I, uh, I appreciate you taking the time to be on the show today, Nora. Can you tell me your URL where people can sign up to learn about your new book and all the other stuff? Because you're one yeah, of the few yeah, holistic the biohackers called... out there. Keep, keep doing what you're doing. So tell oh. people how to find you. Yeah, so the new book I have, which is basically called Rethinking Fatigue, what your adrenals are really telling you and what you can do about it, a very practical guide, um, that is literally going to be out as an ebook in a matter of a few days. And it's going to be out on Amazon Kindle and all the ebook formats. Uh, and uh, you can go to my website, uh, which is primalbody-primalmind.com, and uh, sign up for the free newsletter. I will never abuse your email. I will never, you know, spam you or sell your email to anybody. Uh, but it will put you kind of in the loop when something new comes along. And there is a lot of very big stuff coming along in the extremely near future. So definitely sign up, and uh, and I'll do my best to get you the best information I can. Nora, thanks again for being on Bulletproof Radio. Have an awesome afternoon. Thanks, Dave. You too. One of my favorite sources of protein is upgraded collagen protein. This is a pre-digested form of collagen that comes from grass-fed cows. Collagen is a connective protein. In fact, it's one of the more common proteins in your body. It forms the matrix that your bones grow on. It forms the connective tissue for your skin and your hair and your nails, and it's one of those things you don't really get to eat if you eat a modern diet. Upgraded coffee beans are something that I created for the highest possible mental and physical performance. It's coffee that's processed differently than other coffee. It tastes even better than normal coffee, but it gives you a very different mental feeling. 